The Nets closed out 2023 in an absolutely brutal fashion, going three and nine over the last 12. And one place the eye test and analytics crew can meet in the middle is the Nets have been completely brutal over the last three or so weeks. We're going to break down what's been happening, if there's any way to change it, and what 2024 has in store for this team. We'll get into all that. But first, the theme music. You are Locked On Nets, your daily Brooklyn Nets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, welcome back to the Locked On Nets podcast on the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team, the Brooklyn Nets, every single day of the week. I am Doug Nori, owner-operator of DFSR.com, rolling through NBA and NFL projections basically every single day over there on DFSR. If you want a free trial, go and grab it now. No worries. We got you covered for FanDuel and DraftKings. No Adam Armbrecht on the show today as we work out some New Year's, you know, post New Year's scheduling stuff going on. We'll be back in the saddle going um, paired up for the rest of this week, post game and whatnot. Thanks for making Locked On Nets your first listen of the day. We're free and available on all of those great platforms. Let you know that today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA. Use the code all lowercase locked on NBA for a first deposit match up to $100 over there on prize picks. All right, 2023 in the books, 2024 on tap, bigger and brighter things coming in Nets world. Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> and that's what we're going to talk about today uh, on the podcast as we break down sort of what this last stretch for the Nets has been like, uh, hashtag brutal, and try to talk about one, you know, where the eye test and the analytics meet. And this, these don't always meet because we, you know, obviously with sports, we want to have things to disagree about. We want to have things to be able to discuss. And sometimes ways that you watch can sometimes not line up with the numbers that, that might be underlying some of the things that are happening. But I did want to talk about how this last two or three weeks have gone for the Nets and whether or not it's signal noise, you know, if it's going to be something that we can think about continuing on into the new year or whether there are places for the Nets to improve in the short term and the long term with this current form. Uh, in a couple of days, Adam and I will break down sort of like the long term outlook for the team, too, because I think that's going to be important to begin really, really taking a fine look at when it comes to trade deadline and you know what the plans are for the Nets. But wanted to take a look at this last 12 game stretch, which I think sort of is the beginning or where the 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 swoon started. Right. So back on December 11th, the Nets started a West Coast road trip uh, and they, they've just come off with three straight wins, Orlando, Atlanta, Washington, including a just total blowout of Washington. They start the West Coast trip, which we knew was going to be tough. And there's been very few things to hang your hat on since then. They've been three and nine during that stretch. The only three wins were uh, the game against Phoenix, which got us real excited because obviously it was a uh, victory over Kevin Durant and company. Every other game has been a loss except for the two wins over Detroit. Thank goodness they pulled those off because I'm not even sure where we'd be talking about this team if the Detroit Pistons streak had stopped <laughs> in those two games against the Nets, but they were able to pull those two off. And everything else has been losses, sometimes very bad losses. So losses to Sacramento, Denver, Golden State, Utah, the Knicks, uh, Denver again, Milwaukee, Washington, and Oklahoma City. Uh, more than half of those games were by double digits. Um, so some of these games really just haven't even been all that close when it gets when it's gotten down to the final <laughs> the final buzzer. And it's really been uh, a very tough stretch here for Nets fans and for the team as well. This has been since we've been doing the podcast, I would say this is one of the longer, you know, outside of maybe the beginning of the, C the ba basketball wise. Right. Like not, not I'm not talking about like, you know, Kyrie not being able to play and stuff. I mean, just talking about like on the court stuff outside of maybe the stretch at the beginning of last year 
where Steve Nash was ultimately fired. I'm not sure I can remember a worse long stretch for this team since we've been doing the podcast. That, you know, that's four years now. So, and, and that's just you know thinking about the team every single day. And when you dive into the analytics, part this is partly inspired. Um, Eric Slater over there, at Clutch Points, had done a little bit of a breakdown, kind of taking a look at where the Nets rankings had gone. I went back and just. Uh, did the, did the same, some of the same work here, looking back over where the Nets have ranked over these last three or so weeks, you know, dating back to December 27th, or sorry, December 10th, and where they've really kind of fallen in some key areas that have really kind of just told the story of what's been happening for this team in the short term. And, and the short term, frankly, is starting to become the long term, right? Sometimes things that seem like blips end up becoming the actual picture and you start to look at your it's it's kind of take a look in the mirror time when it comes to a team and that can be really hard and the nets are pushing dangerously close to that place right now like where they stand right now in terms of the standings where they stand in terms of talent where they stand in sort of like a, uh, sort of maybe confusion around where the what the team is where the team is going 15 and 18 at the time of this podcast ninth in the east bulls are moving up uh, you have to feel like the Hawks with Jalen Johnson are probably going to make a little bit of a move here. We'll see what happens with the Raptors with the R after the RJ Barrett and Emmanuel quickly moves. Not really sure. I mean, you have to think that probably maybe ticks them up, but we'll see. Regardless, it doesn't change the fact of what's been happening with this team uh, over this stretch. And it's been really, really bad. So we'll take a look at some key numbers that have signaled some drop offs in where like sort of things that were working for the Nets before this time and then after this time. So we'll start with just three pointers. This Nets team had been shooting a lot of threes over the course of the season and really making a lot of threes, right? Like they had ranked uh, within the top five in terms of three points attempts and three point shooting. But since December 10th, They've dropped off pretty considerably in each of these spots. They've gone down to 15th overall in three-point attempts, and they've gone all the way down to 23rd overall in three-point makes. For a team that doesn't have tons of on-ball juice outside of like Cam Thomas and at times Mikhail Bridges, besides that, like really in terms of on-ball creation, that doesn't have a lot of just in the way of just, you know, just high-end NBA talent and getting your own baskets. This three-point shooting is critical to where the Nets need to be just in terms of ba basically being able to stay afloat. Like They they have to be able to hit trading threes for twos as much as possible against other teams. The beginning of the season, they they were doing that. They were making their threes. Dorian Finney-Smith hitting his threes. Really, everyone was hitting. I, I hate to just call out one guy. Really across the board, they were shooting very, very well from three. That has tailed off, and with it has gone basically a lot of their scoring. If this team is going to drop down into the bottom third, in terms of overall three-point makes, they are going to have a near impossible time winning. It's just that's just the way it goes. And we've seen along with that during this stretch, the offensive rating has gone down to 22nd. So their bottom third overall in offense, based in part on the three-point shooting now in the in the bottom group and just the overall effective field goal percentage really hitting literally rock bottom. So the offensive rating bad, they can't make their threes. And they also, and we've seen this in terms of like the eye test too, we've seen them just not even be able to finish at the rim. We've watched Mikhail Bridges miss layup after layup. We've seen Nick Claxton missing a lot of shots at the rim. I mean, this is a guy who, when your center is missing a lot of shots, you're really in trouble because these are the places that your effective field goal percentage can really get a boost. The Nets over the last, uh, since December 10th, during this this 12-game stretch, the Nets sit dead last in effective field goal percentage. Dead last. Worst offensive team in, in terms of effective field goal percentage in the league. And that makes sense. If you miss all your threes and you miss all your twos, then that's that's where effective field goal percentage comes in. And this is beginning to tell the story of sort of what's been happening here. Now, you want to say to yourself, well, some of these things will regress to the mean. Some of these guys aren't going to continue to shoot that bad. I can hear that, but it's a very, very concerning uh, state of uh, turn of events for where this Nets team has gone. I have a couple other numbers I want to throw out to you that sort of told the tale over these last two years, these last 12 games. We'll get to that in a second. First, I'm going to tell you about our friends over at Prize Picks. Prize Picks is daily fantasy made so easy. That's because all you're doing on Prize Picks is you're going more or less on the Prize Picks projections. Prize Picks puts up the numbers. You go more or less. You pick you know, up to five players. You go into the 25 times your money. You go more or less on those projections. 
And that's how you do it. And you put together the, you put together these combinations and they just made it really easy. You can do these in, you know, 30 seconds, a minute, two minutes, put together different plays over on prize picks. And when I say uh, the different stats, you're going points, rebounds, assists, blocks, steals. That's for NBA. You want to take it over to the NFL. Got a couple more weeks of NFL action. You can go um, receptions, rushing yards, receiving yards, touchdowns, obviously, really everything you can think of over at Prize Picks. And then you can combine the different sports together. Maybe you want to do, you know, three NBA guys, two NFL guys, and away you go. They also have a reboot policy if one of your players is injured. You're really not going to find uh, that on any other daily fantasy sport, sports platform. Prize Picks just figured it out. They took all the fun stuff with daily fantasy, removed some of the more challenging and difficult stuff, and made a really, really cool product. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA. Use the code Lockdown NBA for a first deposit match up to one hundred dollars. It's PrizePicks.com slash Lockdown NBA. Use that code Lockdown NBA first deposit match up to one hundred dollars. Prize Picks is daily fantasy made easy. All right, a couple other numbers where the Nets have uh, it's sort of like be beginning to tell the story of what's been happening with this team over the last couple weeks. We mentioned the effective field goal percentage, mentioned the three point makes, um, mentioned just some of this, uh, just some of the basics that would start to push you into the direction of understanding about like sort of why it's a, when you watch the games, it's, it, it looks so brutal on the offensive end. It's been just as bad, honestly, on defense. Uh, frankly, in some ways it's been worse on, on defense than it has been an offense, which is really, really saying something for a team that so, felt like they were going to begin the season, maybe even hanging their hat on defense with a defensive identity, a bunch of guys who had been projected to be just plus defenders across the board. I mean, Nick Claxton was in, Defensive player of the year conversations for last year. Now, th those are you, those are bred more on whether your team's like doing really well or not. But still, I mean, he was up there. You know, you got him. We have Mikhail Bridges came over uh, from Phoenix with uh, a defensive reputation. Dorian Finney Smith, the same. Uh, th these guys, Cameron Johnson, these guys that had just brought in what we thought was going to be a defensive identity, not to mention the additions of Dennis Smith Jr. and company. Uh, we thought that's where it was going to be. The defense, really, the whole season has been horrible and has not, has, just almost frankly, in some ways, gotten worse over this stretch. Over this, um, over since December 10th, they rank 28th in defensive rating. They rank, and, and part of this is like a combination of different factors here, right? So, one, they rank 28th in steals. They don't generate any steals. They, they cannot seem to get the ball from the other team. This is part of what makes it harder for them on the defensive end. They just can't really generate turnovers. When you can generate turnovers in the NBA, you're going to have a really hard time. Because one, either you're going to gamble and miss and the other team's going to have an easy shot, or you're just not even applying the requisite pressure to the ball to like even make things uncomfortable for the other team. And we've seen this over and over again, right? With other teams seemingly getting very, very easy baskets on the nets. It's just because they're just not generating the, the on-ball defense and even just the scheme is not lending itself to uh, getting into any lanes, getting into ball handlers. Like they're just not doing any of those things. So the steals rank among the worst in the league. Like I said, at 28th with that defensive, uh, the defensive rating all the way down there. Their defensive rebounding is 25th in the league. They've been good on the offensive boards, which is like the one thing that's probably saved them. They rank third in offensive rebounding in this stretch, which makes you even more head scratching about some of the other numbers because they're actually getting rebounds and but just not turning them into anything, right? Like they're getting on the offensive glass but it doesn't end up becoming anything. It doesn't become like easy baskets at the rim. It doesn't go into like kick out threes. It kind of just becomes nothing, <laughs> it seems like. And what we talked about on offense is lending itself to what's happening on defense. They are missing their shots. So they're missing all their threes. When you miss threes, you're going to get longer rebounds. That's going to lend itself to fast break points for their team. They're getting killed in transition. And they're not able to stop. When you're not able to stop teams effectively in the half court, and not able to stop teams in transition, this is what you're going to get. You're going to get a defensive rating at 28th. You're going to get a net rating of 25th. Uh, the opponent's effective field goal percentage, 29th. That mean, The translation on that one, teams are getting super, super easy baskets against the Nets. They're hitting their threes, and they, they're hitting their threes, and they're getting easy baskets at the rim, right? This is where effective field goal percentage is effectively comes from, right? Because you can get a higher effective field goal percentage by essentially hitting either the easiest shots at the rim and or hitting your threes because threes are just worth 50% more than twos. So when you couple those things together, add in the transition, add in that you're not generating any steals and they just, Nets are just having an impossible time on both ends of the court. Like this, these numbers back up 
where the eye test tells you that it's just not working. It's just nothing is has re- nothing has worked over these last couple of weeks outside of those Detroit Pistons games, which they just had to go absolutely all out to make sure that they didn't lose, which is what teams did against the Pistons for a long time. Right. Like you don't want to be the one on the loss ledger. I actually wonder what the situation looks like if the Pistons hadn't been in that situation. Now, I think the Nets probably still take the games, but we saw, you know, the, at least the second one, the Nets had a really fight to make sure they could get over the hump there against this Pistons team who wanted to win. Now, maybe it goes both ways. Pistons really trying to win that game because, you know, they want to get themselves off the schneid. But in all, this has just been a really, really a tough stretch. And if you're watching the games and not looking at any numbers, which a lot of you do out there, and I, you know, go for it. I'm not, there's no, I'm not telling you you have to look at some of these, you know, different just basis points. And these, by the way, a lot of these stats are not really, even, I wouldn't even call them analytics. They're just, basic stats that kind of tell you the story. I know sometimes folks want to, you know, kind of be like, you know, analytics versus eye test. These aren't even really analytics. It's like, I don't know. Do you get offensive rebounds? That's an eye test thing. We can just see that, right? Do you get defensive rebounds? Do you get steals? (laughs) Right. These are just, these numbers are just putting together things that your eyes are already seeing. Anyway, I, I hesitate to even call it analytics. It's, it's really not. It's just like the basics of how NBA is generated ball, go in ball. Don't go in. Right. You know, get the ball from the other team. Don't get the ball from the other team. So I don't even know if we're di- doing all that deep of a dive into the numbers here to just to let everyone sort of know that, you know, that, that the numbers community and the test community can actually meet here in the middle and say, it's been bad, man. It's been so, so bad. And, um, oh, and one more thing, the opponents, uh, turnover percentage, the Nets rank 27th in that. That just kind of goes along with the steals, uh, with, with the steals part, right? So, like, they're just not, they're not, the Nets just aren't generating anything in the way of making it very difficult on the other team, right? They're not making really making the other team sweat, right? On the defensive end or on the offensive end. Like, these aren't really, and this is what leads to these double digit losses, right? Like, yeah, some of these are good teams, obviously, right? OKC is an awesome team. You know, losing to OKC is not a look in the mirror moment for your team, you know, going in facing the thunder in Oklahoma city is not, you don't come out of that and like look in the mirror and be like, not like, like how, how we kind of looked at the Washington game, be like, well, what is going on here, folks? Or the Charlotte game, right. Which might've been a sign that like maybe things were, could, could go off the rails kind of easily. Those are the look in the mirror games. OKC is not that it's a culmination of a run. That's been really tough happens to fall on December 31st. So you can kind of close out the year narratively, uh, and look and say that's how they end 2023. So it ends, it makes for a nice, well, not nice. It makes for a bookend uh, rather than being a game that you really want to take that much from. But it, re- but in the end, it was a bit, it ends up becoming a, a very similar part of the story, right? They go in, they get trounced, they can't stop anything. You know, OKC gets up a ton of threes, makes them all. OKC gets at the basket, makes them all. That's win the offensive rebounding game, still get crushed, right? Like that game exemplified a lot of the things that we're already talking about here with where this team is, that these numbers just aren't going to line up in ways where you're going to be able to generate wins. And that's a concern going into the rest of this year, right? Like we are heading into a season of the trade deadline. We're heading into maybe a time where the Nets are going to need to make some high level macro decisions about their team. And it's interesting to look at these numbers and try to think to yourself what Sean Marks, what Jacques Vaughn and the rest of the team is really saying themselves right now in terms of where things can land. So take a quick look here about what can happen over these next couple of weeks that might change the course for the Nets. We'll get into that here in a second. All right, before we get into that, we'll tell you about our friends over on FanDuel. No better time to get in on the action then I'll right now over on FanDuel. Uh, NFL's regular season's wrapping up, but there's still time to get into what FanDuel has to offer. That's America's number one sports, but right now, new customers over on FanDuel get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. All you have to do is place a $5 real money bet. You heard that right. A $5 real money bet, win or lose, you're going to get $150, $150 bucks in bonus bets back, and that can be used on everything on the site. Live game, same game parlays, uh, you can find bets in the Explore tab. They have a parlay hub where you can do the, the same game parlay stuff, or you can just combine a bunch of different picks from different games. Uh, they have the over-unders. They got the player props. Really, every single way that you can slice and dice this thing, FanDuel has it over there on the site. All you have to do to grab 150 bucks in bonus bets with that $5 bet is visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn. Make your first bet a layup. FanDuel official partner, the NFL and NBA. 
All right, 2024, here we come. Nets, this is is this, is this going to be the year, the year of the Nets? I can't even say. It kind of sounds silly to even say. Uh, I'm not really sure. The Nets are definitely at a crossroads right now. Like I said, Adam and I will get into um, maybe like sort of the state of the team stuff going into this year where the different directions the team can end up taking over the course of these next months and maybe the uh, part of the rest. But in the short term, I mean, can we expect that this kind of downswing is going to continue for the Nets? Now, on the one hand, I'd say, you know, no, because we have a track record from the beginning of the year that shows that the Nets can, can play a different style of basketball that has been able to generate wins. At the same time, New Orleans, Houston, OKC again, they get Portland. Portland been kind of scrappy at times here. They get Cleveland. Uh, they're, you know, they're obviously going over to Paris here uh, for that trip and then back against Miami, Portland, and then L.A. So they have that Paris trip in there. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing for the team. They, you know, they take an extended rest because they only play one game in essentially a week's time, but it involves travel to Europe. So maybe that's like a reset moment for the team. I I'm not really sure how to evaluate situations like that. Again, like getting essentially a week to only play one game in a week, I have to, even with the travel, I have to believe that that's a good thing for the team because they play the January 7th against Portland. Then it's four days. They play Cleveland. Then it's another four days and it's Miami. So from the seventh, from the eighth to the 14th, so six total days, they get one game. That's a, that could be a plot, a spot for the nets to sort of like stop, take stock, get some rest, even with time zone changes, blah, 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 blah. Like they'll be able, and that's like, uh, frankly, not that big of a deal for this amount of time. Like there's just no, I, I think that could be one place where we can like point to and say, oh, this is a good situation for the Nets to be able to get this, right? Like they're going to get, get to play fewer games in that stretch than most other teams. So I think that's like one spot we can look and say, okay, maybe that's a nice spot to rest their legs. They have had a lot of games here. They've been playing. They've had to play back to back, you know, the Detroit Milwaukee back to back. Uh, they had the Denver Detroit back to back, like four games before they played a lot of games. Like during that, that 12 game stretch, they played a lot of games in very, very few days. That that and that that hurts. And and plus games in tough conditions, like in Denver, like in Utah, places that are just not overall easy to play. So you want to look at that and say, okay, maybe they got dealt a sort of a bum hand with the scheduling, and that's a reason to kind of be a little more positive for the time forward. I can see that. Plus the, the sort of the scheduling gap that they get for going overseas, I think that's going to help them as well. Some of this stuff you can also we can point to a little bit and say, Hey, some of this stuff could regress back like the three point shooting. The three point shooting is one of those things that can be lumpy at times. I think we could easily look at that and get another 10 game stretch where the nets just make some more of these threes. And it's a totally different situation. Sometimes basketball does get that easy. Not really. It's not easy to hit your shots and maybe the nets just aren't bred to be an awesome three point shooting team just based on their personnel. But I think there's a world or we could see some of those numbers come back in onto the sort of positive side of that luck arena. And we have a different feeling about the net. So I think those are like two, maybe easy places to look and say in the short term, maybe this can get a little better for the nets. Clearly they need to pick out an identity with this team, about where they want to go with rotations. They do have five man lineups that have worked over the course of the season. I was looking uh, before the Spencer Dinwiddie Bridges, Cam Johnson, uh, DFS Sharp five man combo is, I mean, it's only 60 minutes. It's the best net rating combo in the whole league right now. So maybe you want to think, hey, maybe we should get more Dayron Sharp minutes in here for Claxton. And that's going to be a positive thing. The Cam Thomas situation continues to be a head scratcher. I'm not sure that irons itself out in this, in this term. I, I don't really know how to, I really don't, if you listen to yesterday's show, I don't really know how to evaluate that situation properly. Um, I think, it's really impossible to know sort of like everyone's feelings and if everyone's on the same page with where Cam Thomas is. So I know there's people out there, they're going to be like, Hey, play Cam Thomas a lot more. And maybe that will lead to wins. And I think there's going to be a group that's going to say, Hey, you know, don't play him as much. And you know, it's not like it doesn't generate winning basketball. I don't fall into that side of it, but you know, I'm not sure that the, there's like super amazing clarity around that situation. I think we can, we hopefully can in the short term, stop seeing like Spencer Dinwiddie and Cam Thomas combinations, because that's been a stone cold losing way for the Nets. Like the, the total train wreck on defense. Hopefully we see fewer of those combinations going forward. I think we'll still continue to see some mix and match opportunities uh, for the 
for the different lineups. They are going to get Lonnie Walker back, hopefully pretty soon here. Maybe that lends a little juice off the bench. The Ben Simmons situation, I don't even know where we are. We're probably due for an update on Ben Simmons within the next four to five days. There's been no news, and no news with that stuff is typically either just still no news or not great news. But, you know, maybe there's a world where you see Simmons coming back. I still don't really put, you know, take a lot of stock in that. I think clearly him coming back at like full strength, old Ben Simmons would be a positive. I There's no argument against that. I just don't hold out a lot of hope that it's going to happen. But so, like I said, just to go back to some of that scheduling stuff, some of the shooting, I do think there's worlds where like some of that stuff just improves a little bit and they're able to steal a few of the, a couple of these games. I think that sometimes evaluating teams at their lowest is not always or is often not the best strategy because you're only going to, you, you're just too anchored in the negativity and the bad stuff that you've seen most recently. And I really all want to caution about always doing that because it just doesn't lend itself. It just doesn't lend itself to good analysis as evidence. Like, you know, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, we were like, Hey, we're doing podcasts about how good the nets were. And then it went bad. It can swing the other way very quickly sometimes in, in, Sports are just, we have literally infinity examples of that kind of stuff happening over the years. But so anyway, I do think there are little ways that things can improve here in the short term. This doesn't, this doesn't factor in again, like sort of the macro ideas around this team about whether they should be buyers of the trade deadline, whether they should be sellers of the trade deadline. If some guys are going to be here and some guys aren't like which guys they should lock into for long-term contracts. Like that's a bigger discussion that Adam and I will have over the course of these next week or two or couple weeks as we get you know more information about the team, start to see the landscape of buyers and sellers across the league and try to dive into like really what the next plan should be. Because right now, honestly, this has been a bad stretch, you know, from fan engagement, not a fan engagement. I'm ever ever people out there are still listening. Obviously, I mean more like feelings about the team it's been look this is hard man three and nine over a 12 game stretch it's hard as a fan to to watch stretches like this and feel like it's going to get better but i do think there are some ways where it can over the short term okay we will be back again tomorrow following the game against new orleans so that's the games at eight so we'll be here late on tuesday evening live episode uh win or lose against zion williamson CJ McCollum, Brandon Ingram, and the Pelicans. No worries there. Adam will be back in the saddle for that one also. In the meantime, make sure you subscribe over on YouTube. We're climbing there towards 7,000 subscribers on YouTube. Let's see where we are. I'll do a quick check-in right now. Yeah, yeah, over 6,500 right now. Let's get to 7,000. I mean, let's get to 8,000 by the end of 2000. Is that realistic? 2024? No, let's say 9,000 at the end of 2024. We're just going to throw a random number out there. Help be part of that group. Make sure you subscribe over on YouTube. Subscribe or listen to the podcast as well. Look, this is how we uh, this is how we pay the bills, right? It's free for you. All you got to do is subscribe to those two places. Totally free. Helps us out a lot. Get to the end of this episode. Always forget to get one of the great uh, poets, excuse me, the quotes from the great American poets. That's Adam Armbeck's deal. So we'll say looking forward to the great American poet Adam Armbeck being back tomorrow. Following the Pelicans game, we'll be back again then talking more Brooklyn Nets basketball.